Hey, if you guys are just joining us live, welcome. It is awesome that you are here. You know what, as you can see, the band is all warmed up and ready to go. So you know what, before we do the two minute countdown, I want you to grab your cup of coffee, grab your Red Bull, because you really, really don't want to miss this. All right, we'll see you in two minutes. Roll the countdown.
You can see Jody marked up there as a backing vocal. Really cool. All right, well, if you're just joining us now live, you know, we're in part two of White Flag, and it is awesome that you're joining us because we've got an hour packed, awesome series for you today. So, what we're going to do is we're going to do three amazing songs. Now, while they're singing, if your foot starts tapping or you just want to jump up and put your hands in the air, that's okay. And if the person doing that does that next to you and you think that's really weird, that's also okay. Because you know what? We're inviting God to be part of this and we want to just celebrate. So over to the band. Justice and mercy found a home The God of creation Humbled and clothed in flesh and bone Jesus, the sweetest name I know Heaven is here, heaven is, heaven is, heaven is here Living within us, heaven is here. Heaven is, heaven is, heaven is here. Our God is with us. Oh, our God is with us. This is our freedom. Living to glory. Exalt the sun 
has recently started doing a devotional together about how we worship. And we've learned that praise is when we show our admiration and our acknowledgement of God's greatness. But worship is something so much more. It's a pouring out of our inner selves as we give our love and adoration to God. So wherever you are right now and whatever screen you're watching on, won't you join us as we pour out our love for God and sing his praises and give him worship. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a dream from the world? Jesus is calling. Come on, let's sing. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, 
majestic in wonder you reign with love forever there's no one higher than you your beauty your splendor your glory knows no measure there's no one higher than you you are always with us gracious to forgive us by your power we've been set free and lord we stand amazing in your presence astounded by your mercy and love yes. our hands are lifted high in surrender So last week, we learned all about the story of Jonah and how Jonah was running away from God because he was afraid he was going to get skinned alive. And you know what? If I was in that position, I probably would have done exactly the same. But you know what? I actually have. I have run hard from God, and I'm sure some of you have as well. But you know what? When you hear that little voice, when you hear that nudge, or like me, when your wife volunteers you to just start serving, I would say run towards it, step up, because it's been absolutely amazing for me. Because the more that I have handed over, the closer that I have run towards God, the better my life has become. And you know what, for all my sins now, I'm even an elder in the church, so you never know. So what I wanna do is I just wanna open in prayer. So Lord, 
All I ask is that you open our hearts today as we listen to Chris's message, that instead of running away from you, we can see that we have a loving God with his arms open wide, waiting for us to just turn and run towards you. I pray this all in your name. Amen. Hey there, South Point Church. It's good to see you guys this morning. Um, actually, hang on. I've got a bit of housekeeping that I have to do here. You know, it's a shame because if we had just a, a couple more volunteers that would uh, volunteer in production, the pastor wouldn't have to bring out his own TV screen. But for now, I guess I'm, I'm stuck doing this. But you on the other end of there, you can, you can volunteer and you can help. So uh, let me, in fact, turn it on. So once again, uh, we're on. There we go, guys. And this is what happens when you don't have volunteers. You end up with a, with a, with a bad signal here. Everyone in the tech world is just saying, why is that guy touching the, uh, why is that guy touching the TV? Listen, if someone says I'm not capable, I want you to take the footage from this and I want you to rewind it and show them because I, I'm a capable guy. I can figure stuff out. Okay, let's get into the service here. It is good to be here. And that is a silly illustration that we're using, but we at South Point Church, we do need volunteers. We do have safe spaces for you guys to volunteer. We have tons of room in the production environment. We've got room in our kids' environments. There are places where you can get involved so that you can prevent someone like me from wheeling out a TV screen and letting things like that happen. So thank you for participating in our fun this morning, but we're gonna get into this week like Sean said, this is week two of a series called White Flag. And White Flag is when surrender is the only option that is left. And I'm really excited about this week because this is gonna be a special message. And I told you guys last week that this week was gonna be really special. If you didn't see last week's message, please go online, go on YouTube, find that message, watch it, then, then come back to this one or, or watch this one, then go to that one. But it was really good and it'll really tie in together. Uh, if I had to do a quick recap for you, I would say that uh, last week what we talked about is exactly like what happens when we run from God? Like what happens when we as people decide that we're going to be runners? You know, we talked about this term of being a runner, not, a, a, not like, a, like a, an endurance runner, but someone who runs from God. And we used the story of Jonah to learn that. And through the story of Jonah, God started to reveal his heart for us as people that run from God. So God's heart, it's important that we understand it because God's heart when we run, God's heart when we decide not to do what he's asked us to do, or God's heart when we decide to be different than what he's asked us to be, it's not a heart to pay us back. God's not trying to just like get us and hammer us. It's not about the payback with God. It's about the win back. It's about the bring back. We learn that God does everything to win us back, to bring us back into his arms. So we also learned in the story of Jonah that uh, God would actually use crazy things to do this with us. And with Jonah, he used a whale. And through this whale, God taught us this, this amazing lesson that we get to apply. So last week I told all the runners that are out there, everyone that's a runner, I said, listen, all you runners, this week we're coming for you. I'm gonna give you one more week to run. Well, now it's time. This week, I hope you're here. I hope you're tuned in because this is the week that I'm coming for you. I want you guys to stop running. I want you guys to get caught. But what is a runner? So let me, you may not know that you're a runner, so I'm gonna tell you what it is. A runner is someone that's actually moving in the opposite direction of what God is calling you to. Or, and that can look like maybe you're actively moving away from something God's called you to. Or maybe that could be God saying, hey, I want you to go do this. And instead you say, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay right here. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna move. And we talked about a famous runner. We talked about the most famous runner in the Bible. And we're gonna put a map on the screen for you guys to see here again. This is, this is the greatest for me this encapsulates just the, the best thing about a runner and the desperation that man will go through 
to try and run from something that God is calling them to. So Jonah, he was actually called to a town called Nineveh, okay? So Jonah is in Joppa. We'll do this quickly because we saw it last week. Nineveh is 550 miles away, but, but that is, is a, a relatively short journey in the context of this story. God's like, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to go out there. Jonah says, nah, I'm okay. And God's like, no, Nineveh. Jonah says, no, not. God says, no, Nineveh. So Jonah ends up going, trying to go to Tarshish. He gets on a boat. Now, a boat in these days is not a safe thing to do. And then he goes 2,500 miles away from Nineveh. Jonah goes to the absolute end of the earth to get away from God's calling. But instead, God throws a wrench in Jonah's plans. He says, you're trying to get away from me, Jonah. I love you too much for that. So God drops a storm on the boat. He, he then drops all kinds of chaos and disaster on them. Jonah ends up getting thrown overboard because the ship is about to sink. And then Jonah's sinking in the water and he's about to die. So Jonah has given his life up to say, you know what, save the sailors, throw me overboard, I'm done. Because Jonah would rather die in the middle of the ocean than he would rather do what God's called him to do and go to, go to Nineveh. And that brings us to this verse here, Jonah 1.17. It says, now the Lord had prepared a great fish. It's amazing. The Lord prepared. I could just see God crafting this fish for the purpose of aggravating Jonah. Like, I just think God just in his way put this fish together and prepared it to swallow Jonah, even to the point that it would keep him alive. So the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. So it's, it's after, so Jonah is thrown over, he gets swallowed by this fish and it's actually, today we're gonna talk about this prayer that Jonah writes down and that comes out after Jonah gets rescued from, from the fish. So Jonah gets rescued from the fish and we'll learn about that later. And then he goes and he journals this prayer. And it's this prayer that we're going to look at today. It's this prayer that's in, that's in chapter 2 that I think is so special for us. But before we look at that, the first thing I want to do is I want to issue a challenge. I want to issue a challenge to all of our runners. All the runners out there, I just want to say, listen, you can't run forever. So eventually you're going to get caught or, or life is going to catch up to you. You're not good enough to run forever. You can't stay on the run forever. You may think that you've carved out this comfortable little life of yours that's running from the calling that God's given you or something that God has spoken to you and you say, nope, I'm going to go this path and this path only. I'm running from God. I felt God touch my heart in that church service. I'm not answering it. I'm not responding to it. I know how some of you men out there do. You just cross your arms harder. You just pull tighter. And that's kind of like saying, God, don't care. Not going to do it. But listen, guys, at some point, you're going to have to surrender. And the reason you're going to have to surrender is because you know that your running has too big of an impact on you and has too big of an impact on others. Your running is impacting you and it's impacting others. And one day, one day, you're going to end up in the belly of a whale, just like Jonah, because God loves you. Now, what we want as runners, we want God to be all about that grace, you know? So we want God to be all about the grace, but instead, God is all love. And so what we have to learn, and we learn this through the story of Jonah, we learn this through chapter two that we're going to look at today, that, that love is actually tough. I mean, we all know this, um, the phrase like tough love. You know, love is tough, tough love. You know, your parents, I don't know if they've ever told you like, you know, hey, this is going to be a dose of tough love. But what we learn about God's tough love is because the love, it comes from God. Because it's God, God gives us this, he has this incredibly generous amount of grace. It, God is so generous with grace for us, but he's very thorough with his discipline as well. So we want just the grace, we don't want the discipline. But what God says is because his love is so good and so perfect for us, yes, he's generous with grace, but 
He's also very thorough with discipline. And we're going to see that thoroughness. And for example, in Jonah's story, we see how thorough that God was with discipline because he created a fish, a beast, a monster of the sea to actually swallow Jonah. I mean, God went through extreme lengths to get Jonah. And he'll do the same for us because he's, his love is for us. His grace is generous, but he's, he's thorough in his discipline. Now, before we go any further, I want to remind you that God is not a God that wants to pay us back. He doesn't pay us back for what we do wrong. He doesn't pay us back for our sins. You know, if you have like a, like a moral cheat day, God's not after you to get you, to nail you down, to pay you back for that. God's not the God of the payback. God is the God of the win back. God's the God of the bring back. And he does that through his love. Everything God does is to win you back and to bring you back. So we're going to look at chapter 2 again here. We're going we're gonna to go into, into this. Now remember, Jonah, he's been in this well for three days and three nights. And this is this prayer that, that he writes, this thing that he journals. And he's been in the well three days and three nights. And he, he prays this white flag prayer. This prayer of his is his prayer of surrender. It's a white flag prayer. He says, I'm throwing up the white flag, God. I surrender. I bet he did. Inside a fish, I bet he surrendered. And he says, in my distress, I called to you, Lord. In my distress, I called to you. The verse actually says, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. I called to the Lord in my distress and he answered me. I cried out for help and God, you heard my voice. You know, isn't, isn't this true for many of us? In our, in our distress, we call to God. It's, it's in our distress that all of a sudden we, we think like, oh, that God that we've been ignoring, I'm gonna call to him. The God that I've been avoiding, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call to him. Oh, the God that, that's been chasing me down, that I've made myself unavailable for, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call to that in my distress. I mean, how many, how many times have we prayed these prayers where we've said, God, but if you would just, if you would just get me through this one thing here, man, if you would just get me through this one thing, on the other side of this, I will absolutely be sold out for you. I'll give you my life. And then, then you get through it and you're like, okay, maybe the next thing or maybe the next thing. So what I want to ask you is, what is your place of distress? Where, where is it in your life that you feel this tension, that you feel the distress? Because I can tell you now, if you're running from God, if you're a chosen one that God has touched, that God has called, that God has spoken to, and you're running, you may not be in distress yet, but it's coming. Do you see it coming? Are you in it now? See, from, from this place of distress, Jonah then, he calls to God. And when he calls to God, he, he, he cries to God. And it's, it's amazing because God listens to our cry. God listens for our cry. So in our distress, we call to God and God is faithful in that he listens for our cry. Those of you out there that are in your distress, I want you to be trusting because your heavenly father is listening for your cry. Jonah 2 verse 2 continues with this. It says, from the deep, so this is Jonah. He's actually in, he's in the water. From the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. So Jonah's talking to God. Understand the deep that he's talking about here. From the deep in the realm of the dead, this means that Jonah's like, I'm dead. This is over. This is done. I'm in a fish. Don't know where I am, how I got here, but I'm in, I, this is done. I, I'm, I'm just waiting to die. And from that realm of the dead, he called for help and he recognizes, God, you actually listened to me. I wanna to speak to a bunch of people right now because there's a ton of people out there that are automatically disqualifying yourself from what God wants to listen to. So you've said, you know what? I can't do this. I can't call out to God. I can't call and let him listen to me because I'm disqualified. 
See, I know what I did on Friday night, so I'm disqualified. I know what I did last week, I'm disqualified. I know that I spent the last 10 years of my life making fun of Christians, I'm disqualified. I know that every single day I live with guilt. I know that, I know that every day I drink too much. I know I'm not a good enough dad. I know I'm not a good enough mom. I know that I should come to church, but I haven't been to church. I know that thing that I said to the lady in the parking lot that I know is also going to this church, so therefore I'm not ever gonna come to this church because it wasn't a very nice thing that I said. We disqualify ourselves from God. We say, because I did, I can't bring myself to God. Jonah 2.2 is a great example because Jonah has messed up so much He's messed up so badly with God that from the realm of the dead, now none of us, that I know, well, some of you may be, but I doubt it. From the realm of the dead, Jonah calls to God. Do you understand that? God's using this to show us there's absolutely nothing that can disqualify you from God. There's always an open door for you. So what I want you guys to think about then, if there's always an open door, if, if Jonah calls out in his distress, if God listens to the cry, if, if, if we can come, even from the depths, from the realm of the dead, if we can come and we can, we can speak to him, if God is for us, if God was for Jonah, then, then why is there so much chaos in this story? Why on earth is there so much chaos to Jonah getting swallowed by the whale? Why, why not? Why not Jonah just get forgiven and God be like, it's cool, bro. You know, fist pound, Jonah walks on water. We know later Jesus is gonna do that. So God could have let Jonah do that. No, he didn't. Jonah, Jonah sat in chaos and calamity. See, God is behind your chaos. God is actually behind your chaos. This is something that, that is taboo. We don't wanna believe this. We don't wanna understand this. So you're saying, is God behind my split marriage? Is God behind my, whatever it is, but there's, my brain is filtering saying, don't say that, don't say that, don't say that, don't say that, because this is so taboo. It's something we don't want to consider. Did God make your marriage break up? No. But if you, if you, if you had an affair or if you brought sin into your marriage, God can still use that. He can still use that because he's sovereign. Sometimes God even creates a little bit of chaos. Sometimes he shakes our life up a little bit because he knows what we need. Now that's different from, from you know, your marriage falling apart or, or something like that. We don't serve a, a God that just walks around and breaks, breaks things. We do a good enough job at breaking things. What God does a great job of doing is God steps into the chaos and he says, you know what, I love you so much, I'm gonna bring you back. Because I'm the God of the bring back, not the God of the payback. So we're going to go to Jonah 2, verse 3. It says that when you threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas. So Jonah, I want to pause there. Jonah says, you, when you threw. So God actually threw, Jonah recognizes that God, it was actually God that threw him into the sea. It wasn't the sailors that we talked about last week. It was God. Jonah's like, okay, God, I know this was you. I know you had a part in this. So what I want you to do is I want you to look at your chaos. I want you to look at what chaos maybe is transpiring in your life. What are the things that you're dealing with? What are the things that you're going through? What are the storms? When you threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas, the current, the current overcame me. All your breakers and your billows, they swept over me. Where do you have a breaker and a billow in your life? Where do you have waves that are sweeping over you? Where do you have that chaos? Can I just dare you to ask, is God behind that? Even if God didn't create it, is God like behind it? Meaning if you peek through that chaos, you can actually see that God is positioned to do something absolutely incredible in your life. That's a hard thing to consider. That's a very, very hard question. That's a very hard way to look at your life. It takes a lot of maturity. It takes a lot of courage and bravery. See, we tend to our default, and this is my default as well, is we tend to love being the victim. 
The reason we love to be the victim is because it's easier when it's someone else's fault. It's great when I can just say, yeah, you know what, that's not on me. So-and-so did that. And so therefore I'm in this position, I'm a victim. Because they did, I am. That's easy. Because then we never have to take ownership of anything. We never have to accept that we did anything wrong. It also means that we never have to put ourselves in a place where we peek through the curtains of the chaos to see, is God back there? Is God through there? If I move the chaos curtain a little bit to the side, can I see him? Can I see his feet at least? Can I see his hand moving lightly, gently? Can I see him behind my chaos? He's there. There's no chaos that's out there that God can't still move through and work through. So we're going to continue here in verse 4. Jonah, he goes on to say, And I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. So Jonah, what Jonah's saying here is that Jonah's basically saying that, you know what? I... I've been, we we see a change in Jonah's heart a little bit. Jonah says, I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. Jonah's like, you know what, God? You've banished me. I'm completely banished. I get it. I ran away. I almost sunk a boat. I did all this stuff. I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't want to deal with any of that. I, you threw me overboard. I let myself sink. I'm in the depths of the, of the realm of death. And you know what? I accept it. I've been banished from your sight. The idea that Jonah would be completely separated from God. Completely separated from God and God's sight. And in that, Jonah, his heart, because our hearts are created to desire God. Even in that, Jonah says, Lord, I will look to you. Once more, I will look to your holy temple. And what Jonah is saying is, if I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out worshiping. I'm at, I'm at least going to go out on a worship. Jonah, see, still wants to worship God one more time. Now, this brings me to an important question because we've, we've seen this shift. So Jonah has all of a sudden now accepted his position accepted it to the point that he said, you know what, if it all goes square, I'm at least going to go out worshiping God. What happened here? When, When do you think Jonah finally repented? When did Jonah say, okay, God, forgive me. I'm sorry. Like when did Jonah give up on this, uh, I don't want to go to Nineveh. I'm not going to go to Nineveh. When was the moment of repentance? Was it in the belly of the fish? Was it right here? Was it in verse four? You know, I bet it was in one, two. I bet right there before Jonah got chucked overboard, I bet he was saying, oh God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The repentance was there. I guarantee you the repentance was there. But why did God still let Jonah go through the whale? Why why did he do that? You see, we, we have this huge misunderstanding that instant forgiveness actually is going to give us instant relief. See, we feel like that, that if I'm instantly forgiven, so, okay, God, I recognize I did this wrong, and so you're going to forgive me, and therefore my situation should immediately change. Right here, Jonah is saying, I, I know that I was created for you and to worship you. I don't see my situation changing, so I'm still, I'm going to worship you. And this is the moment. These are these moments where we we actually learn that God is super generous with grace, but he's very thorough with discipline. See, God knew what it would take to change Jonah. God knew that if he did anything less, he wouldn't be loving Jonah all the way into the relationship that he wanted to love him into. God knew what it would take for Jonah. And guess what? God, he knows what it will take for you. If you're a runner, if you feel like you're at the bottom of the, of, the, of the whale on the bottom of the ocean, God knows what it'll take for you. And he's willing, because his grace is generous and his discipline is thorough, he's willing to do that. He's willing to go to the depths of what it takes to inspire change in you. 
See, we know this because God has proven time and time again that he actually wants what's best for us. And so we're going to look at Jonah 2, 5 and 6. And this is going to describe Jonah's actually, his actual deliverance. So this is the moment where Jonah is actually experiences this, this deliverance. And it says, the water engulfed me up to the neck. My wife is terrified of drowning. There's a, a funny story. I think I've said it before. And when we were married, I thought it would be fun to dunk my wife. We had a pool and we were swimming and we had just recently gotten married. And I thought, well, ha ha, this is going to be super fun. I'm just going to dunk Casey. And I, I came up behind her and Leaf is in the pool and I'm in the pool. And, and I, I jumped on her and I just dunk, dunked her under. She came up, fists flailing, arms flailing, and she was, she was crying. So I thought, well, this is great. I'm a year into marriage. I'm standing in the middle of a pool and my wife is shuddering in the water because she's crying. I did not know that she was terrified of drowning. She would not do well in verse five. The water engulfed me up to the neck. The watery depths overcame me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. You Cape Town surfers, I don't know how you get into the, into the seaweed and that stuff. I, just, I don't even want to touch it. So Jonah is in the well. And it's full of water, it's full of seaweed, it's wrapped around his head, it's wrapped around his neck. And Jonah says, I sank to the foundations of the mountains. This is where the mountain comes all the way down in the ocean, all the way to the bottom of the ocean. Jonah sank to that foundation and then the earth's gates shut behind me forever. So the earth's gates have shut. He, he feels like he's trapped, he's sunk, he's down there. But then it goes on to say this, then you, then you raised my life from the pit, Lord my God. So I wanna ask you, are you guys waiting? Are you waiting on God to work? Are you, are you in a position where you're, you're waiting on God to do something? Are you, are you in the belly of the fish? You know, are you sitting there in the belly and you're like, okay, God, I'm, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to do something here. But the thing I want to ask you is this, what if being in the belly is actually God walking with you? What if God knows that you need to get to this moment, but in order to get to that moment, he's going to have to walk with you into the belly of a fish? See, remember, God is not the God of the payback. God is the God of the bring back. God is the God of the win back. Everything that happens in your life, everything that God walks with you, he brings you to a place where you can say, then you, then you raise my life from the pit. See, surrender, which is where Jonah got to in the verse before, where Jonah said, even if I'm going out, I'm going out worshiping you, God. Surrender. That brings us to our turning point. And our turning point often starts, our turning point often starts with, but you, Lord my God. See, Jonah said in, in chapter two, six and seven, but you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. I remembered you, Lord, in my prayer, it rose to you. See, Jonah recognizes that he remembered God and his prayer rose to God. Jonah's like bewildered again that God hears his prayer. It shows us that God never stops hearing our prayer. It shows us that God never gives up on listening for our prayers. You know, I'm so thankful that I serve a but you God I'm so thankful that I serve a God that in my lowest moments, I can say, but you. I'm so thankful that no matter how much I've messed up today or how much I messed up last week, I can still say, I can still praise, I can still worship God. And then I can say, God, but you, Lord, my God, you heard my prayer. My prayer rose to you. So how many of us are in the depths? How many of us are in the belly of the fish and we're desperate for a but you moment? 
How many of us are absolutely desperate for that moment? But you, man, I wish I had a but you moment. My business is falling apart. My life is falling apart. Man, I wish I had a moment where I could say, but you heard me, God. Work is falling apart. Life is stressful. The dog died. So, I mean, it's, it's something for everybody, always. And, and I know there's so many of you out there that are saying, Jonah gets rescued from a whale and I've got four spare tires on my car. Where is my but you moment? I want you to know, even with four spare tires on your car, God has a but you, but you moment. A moment where you will say, but you, Lord my God, I prayed in my prayer, it rose up to you. That's the God we serve. And today we're gonna to get a chance to surrender. Today we're gonna to get a chance to give over. We're gonna get a chance to surrender everything that we're holding on to. Remember, surrender. It, surrender comes at our turning point. Who wants a turning point today? Do you? Do you want a turning point? Or no, I mean, maybe you're happy where you are. Maybe you're super happy in, in whatever it is that you're doing or, or however life is working out for you. Now, remember, I'm talking to my runners here. I believe that my runners, I believe some of you out there, you're ready for a turning point. And today we're gonna get to do that. And that starts through surrender. But before we do that, we have to face one more thing in our lives. There's one thing I need you to face because this has got to be authentic. It's got to be real. And it's in Jonah 2.8. And it tells us that if we cherish, or it says those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love. And what Jonah is saying there is that, listen, the things that you ran to when you ran away from God because see, when we run away from God, we run to something because our hearts were created to need God. Our, cry, our hearts were created with this hole in our heart. We have this shape that's here. It's a God-sized cutout. And when we run from God, we try and put something else in there. We put alcohol in there. We put, we put relationships in there. We put money in there. We put pride in there. We put all these things in there. When we ran from God, we ran to something. And that something that you ran to has got to go. Because that something that you ran to, that's what's putting you in the belly. That's what's got you in the whale's belly. Listen, we can get out of the whale today. We can get out of the whale. Who wants out of the whale today? Because that can happen. In your living room, wherever you are right now, think to yourself, I can actually, okay, this is gonna happen, it's gonna happen. That's it, I'm done being a runner. No more running, Abs no more, I'm done. Listen, if you can agree with that, if you want that, if your heart yearns for that, come on. We're gonna get out of the well today. All you have to do is surrender. And you gotta remember that God's not a God that's gonna pay you back for what you've done. Rather, he's the God that wants to win you back. He wants to bring you back. So let's look, where, where do we see Jesus in this? These are questions we ask every single week. Where do we see Jesus in this? Well, this, to me, this is an obvious thing. Jesus, Jesus, is, Jesus is in the well. Jesus made the well. Jesus is actually sitting with us in the well. See, again, God and Jesus, they're not out to pay us back for what we've done. I can't say that enough to you. I want you guys to know that God, your heavenly father, has a door wide open for you. All you have to do is surrender. God may be generous with his grace and he may be thorough with his discipline, but above all, he is a loving, loving father. So then that brings this, where do we find ourselves in this? Where do we find us in this? This is it. If you're, if you're tired of being a runner, this is where you surrender. Okay, get ready. If you're, if you're nervous about what room you're in, or if you're nervous, go somewhere else, Ta pick up your phone, pick up your tablet, or you know what, men, if you're a man out there 
and you're, and you're leading your family, or even if you're not leading in your family, you know you're leading your family anyway because they're looking to you and you feel that God's been talking to you. This is, and you feel like there's some surrender, there's something in your life that you wanna surrender and you wanna give up to God. If you're ready to get out of the belly of the well, if you're ready for your turning point, if you're ready, if you're, if you're done running, you surrender. It happens now. And, and we're gonna have an option to do that. And so this is what I want us to do. Guys, you can get on your knees wherever you are. You can stand, you can stay sitting in the couch. You can put the kids in the backyard, whatever you need to do. But I want you to create, I want you to get quiet with God. Even if you don't move, I want you just to open your heart up to God. Okay, I want you to just, just close your eyes at least. I want you to open up and I want you to say, God, I'm a runner. God, I've been running from you for way too long. God, I no longer want to be a runner. God, I want to surrender my heart to you. And guys, when you do that, when you pray that prayer, when you surrender your heart to Jesus, when you surrender your heart back to Jesus, maybe you're already a Christian. You know, Jonah was already a prophet and he, sur he had to surrender. We surrender every day sometimes. But if you're a runner, you're not disqualified. There's nothing against you. You have this moment right now. And I, I even, for all you people that want a quick service, tough, because there's a, there's a woman out there on a couch that's broken. There's a father out there that wants to lead his family and he's terrified. There's kids, there's 13, there's 14 year olds that are, that are already into things that they should have never been into. And they're sitting in the belly of the whale right now. And maybe they hear this and maybe they need just that extra little moment. You know, if you don't need this moment, then I want you to pray for the people that do. Hey, at South Point, we're a church that prays and we believe in praying for people. But if you need this moment, it's easy. You say, God, I surrender to you. I no longer wanna be a runner. And then you let go. You let go of the things that you were running to when you ran from God. You just let go. And we see in Jonah, one of the best ways that we let go, one of the best ways that we find ourselves in this situation is through worship. That was, that was part of Jonah's surrender, part of his humbling. And that's something I would like to ask you to do is worship God. Okay, so how do you worship God? Well, right now, that's easy. You close your eyes and you just say, God, you're amazing. Thanks for getting me out of the belly of the well. Thank you for helping me surrender. Wow, God, you love me this much? It's amazing. See, what I wanna hear is I wanna hear you absolutely declare God's salvation, God's love, God's grace, God's discipline over your life. I wanna hear you declare it over your life. And then I wanna hear the stories this week, just the outpouring of stories of what happens when we surrender to God and we stop being a runner and we give our hearts to God. We give our lives to God and we watch him completely, completely change us. My prayer for everybody, I'm gonna close in prayer for us. Heavenly Father, my prayer for everyone out there is that you would speak to every runner that's out there. I pray that every Jonah that's out there, every runner that's out there that can hear my voice. I pray, Father, over everybody that feels like they're disqualified from you because they're in the belly of a fish. I pray, Lord, that they hear your voice. I pray, Father, they hear your whisper. I pray, Lord, that your love would just wash over them and that they would know that if you can hear the prayers of Jonah in the bottom of the ocean, in the belly of a fish, that you can hear their prayers coming from a couch or from a car seat or from work or from home or from wherever. But God, you're a good and faithful God. And I just pray life change, unspeakable life change over some people that desperately, desperately need it. And in Jesus' name, amen. I am so excited about what's gonna happen from God's message for you today. Thank you.
Awesome. Well, you know, that was the most amazing message so far, but you definitely don't want to miss next week where Chris finishes the conclusion to this three-part series. And you know what? If you've got kids uh, age 2 to 18, we have an awesome kids uh, set of messages. Uh, so you can log into our website and you can get uh, access to those. You definitely want to don't miss that. So if this message has got to you, it's got to your heart, or you know somebody that might be needing to hear this, share this because we're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, we can send you the link. So just drop an email, you'll see it come up on the screen just now. You know what? We're so glad you joined us. Join us this time next week. Goodbye, everybody. Woo!